Hey guys, I'm John and welcome to Respect Your Intellect. It's been a while coming and a lot of you asked me to cover this topic so it's finally here. In this video, we're gonna talk about what evolution is exactly and how it works. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and let's get started. So let's first start by defining what evolution is. Evolution is simply a change in the heritable characteristics of populations over successive generations. These characteristics or traits are the expressions of genes that are passed from parent to offspring during reproduction. Though it can start with a mutation in a single offspring, evolution is not something that happens to individuals, but rather to populations as a whole. Evolution also has no target form that it's aiming for. It's a process of constant adaptation that has always happened and will always continue to happen because it's just the way nature works. One thing that comes back very often, as with many other scientific theories, is the misunderstanding that evolutionary theory is just a theory. Now we've addressed this before, but we'll go over it again here seeing as how important it is to understand. Scientific theories are never just theories in the general sense of the term we use every day, which is meant to mean a hunch or speculation. The way we use the term theory in everyday conversation is rather more along the lines of a scientific hypothesis. Once scientific hypotheses gain enough supporting evidence, they graduate into a theory, and it becomes so solid that it's very unlikely that new evidence would alter it in any significant way at that point. So scientific theories are actually the result of scientific hypotheses that haven't been proven wrong, and also brings many other facts together from many different disciplines. It's important to remember that in science, we never try to prove theories to be correct. We only try to prove them wrong by fal falsifying them scientifically. And it's the failure to do so that makes scientific theories uh, be considered as facts. Evolution is one such theory that has withstood the test of time through countless scrutiny over more than 150 years and is definitely considered a fact today. Many scientific advancements in physics, geology, chemistry, and molecular biology have supported, refined, and even expanded our understanding of evolution to what we know today. Stick around and we'll cover the evidence that supports evolution in a, a little bit later in the video. So now, in order to dive further into evolution, we need to understand what DNA is and how it works. Just like computer software is written in code that becomes instructions that the CPU can understand, biological organisms are written in as DNA. So DNA is essentially the code that makes up every living thing on Earth. Just like computers do everything with ones and zeros, DNA does everything with four letters, A, T, C, and G. A always pairs with T and C always pairs with G. Because of this, a strand of DNA can be split down the middle, and two new strands of DNA can be reformed exactly like the original because of the forced pairings. That said, nature is not perfect, and sometimes mistakes are made when DNA is copied. These mistakes are what we call DNA mutations, and they can result from deletions where one or more letters are left out, substitutions where letters are changed, or insertions where letters are added. DNA mutations are the main driving factor of evolution, because without it, organisms wouldn't have changing traits over time. Now, these mutations don't always make things more fit to survive. It's a random change that can either make something more fit to survive in their environment, reproduce and pass on their genes, uh, or it can be a bad change that makes uh, the organism more vulnerable or weak, leading to less survivability and less reproduction. The bad traits are gradually eliminated from the population, and the good traits are propagated throughout the population as the more fit organisms survive long enough to pass on their genes. Just as a side note here, now that you know how DNA is coded, we have over 3 billion letters in the human genome. So with a mutation that changes only a single letter, it may seem too small to be significant. But really, most life-altering diseases are caused by single incorrect letters in specific genes of a person's genome. 
This incorrect coding of a gene leads to having a gene that doesn't behave as it should, so their whole mechanics start misbehaving and causing issues. I'm gonna refer you to one of my other videos that talks about the CRISPR-Cas9 technology that allows us to replace these bad letters very easily and potentially fix a lot of very bad problems as they occur. So now let's talk about how DNA and its mutations are propagated. With single-celled organisms that aren't dependent on sex to reproduce, they actually reproduce using mitosis. This is the process in which a cell divides and becomes two new cells that are each identical to the original. It happens by splitting the DNA of one cell, separating them, then reconstituting them into two identical copies of the original to become two entirely new and independent cells. So mitosis has the benefit of transferring 100% of the parent's DNA to the offspring, plus any mutations that occur. So a single-celled organism uh, with a trait that gives an advantage in survivability will spread more easily throughout the population since the parent is guaranteed to pass it on to the offspring using mitosis. With more complex species though, sex evolved and introduced more biodiversity in all those populations. Sex, however, comes with many disadvantages, like only transferring 50% of each parent's DNA. Uh, there's competition in finding a mate. Uh, there's sperm competition in species where females mate with multiple males. Um, and uh, there's exposure to sexually transmitted diseases, and so on. So that brings us to evolution versus natural selection. These are not the same thing, and it's important to know the distinction between the two. As we've already covered, evolution refers to the changing traits throughout a whole population. Natural selection, on the other hand, refers to the ability of an individual organism to survive and reproduce in an environment. Though evolution and natural selection are two very distinct things, natural selection is the main driving factor for evolution. So let's take a look at some examples of evolution now, starting with dogs. Today there are more than 170 different recognized breeds of dogs and all of them share about 99% of their DNA, including wolves. To put this into perspective, any two humans on the planet are always coded 99.9% .9 the same, so all the diversity we see in humans is all coded in just 0.1% of our genome. On the other hand, the difference between humans and chimps or bonobos is only about 1%. So you can see how much a single percentage point can account for some huge differences. While all dogs and wolves also share 99% uh, the same DNA, so they also have a 1% difference in their genome. This single percentage point is where the incredible amount of diversity in dogs is today. This all happened through guided evolution by humans, using selective breeding. If you trace back uh, any dog's lineage, you'll always get to grey wolves because that's their common ancestor. In fact, every living thing on, on Earth has a common ancestor if you go back far enough. Here's some literal food for thought. Even humans and bananas, yes, that simple yellow fruit, share 60% of their DNA and have a common ancestor high up in the evolutionary tree. So back to dogs and wolves. About 10,000 years ago, or up to 34,000 years ago depending on some studies, wolves started to get domesticated by humans. They started by domesticating wolves that were willing to approach humans, and that was the trait that started the whole dog species. By selecting and breeding wolves that were uh, willing to come close to humans, we highly influenced that trait to show up in their offspring. After a couple of generations of selecting for docile wolves, we started having wolves that would even prefer staying by a human's side rather than live in the wild, and that's where the dog species was born. Once we started having more dogs around us, we could start to breed them selectively to encourage other traits to show up or become more pronounced. Some bred for strength by breeding only the strongest males and females together. Some bred for speed, some bred for size, some bred for looks, and so on. This is what leads to the incredible diversity of dogs that we have today, and it's continuing to happen as we move forward. Today, we even pushed some breeds so far into a trait that we caused problems for them. One example is English Bulldogs that were selected for shorter nose shapes. 
and is causing breathing difficulties and chronic discomfort for them today. This problem starts at birth, it lasts for their entire lives and it prevents them from exercising normally. It just goes to show that there is no limit to what we can influence to evolve if we control the environment enough that survival in the wild is not necessary. If we uh, had tried to breed wolves this way and uh, kept sending them back out into the wild, they would never survive the harsh conditions because the traits we'd be encouraging are traits that make them less fit to survive. In other words, they wouldn't be able to chase down their food because they'd run out of breath and eventually die off due to starvation or exhaustion. So this example of the evolution of dogs is actually an example of guided evolution through selective breeding. When we don't interfere, then it's the environment that determines the traits that are favorable to evolve. This is where natural selection comes in. Let's say for example that two birds mate together and they both have a somewhat dull beak. Let's also say that they have five offsprings between them where two of them get a mutation and the three others remain very similar to the parents. Let's say that the first mutation was a slightly sharper beak that helps kill prey more easily and have more success in finding food. And let's say that the second mutation was a shorter wingspan that results in less speed, more strength required to fly, and makes it harder to carry heavy prey up to its nest. Now, as the offsprings grow up and start hunting for themselves, we'll find that the one with the sharper beak has more success on average and lives healthier than the rest. The other three that are similar to the parents also have the same success on average as their parents, and the one with the shorter wingspan just has less success in general. The one with the shorter wingspan might even starve to death itself from the inability to eat safely high in a tree, or it might be unable to feed its own offspring due to the inability of carrying its food up to its nest. All in all, the sharper beak will be the most likely to pass on its genes, followed by the three normal ones, and the last one with the shorter wingspan might not even be able to take care of its own offspring, if it gets to have any offspring at all. These types of mutations happen all the time in all living species on Earth. Some species even evolve traits specifically so that other species can exploit and ensure their survival. Think about how flowers allow bees to exploit them and pollinate that way. Think about how corn gave us ethanol that we can exploit and resulted in a 700% increase in corn plantation since early 2000. And there are many more examples of this. As species change over time, it will directly influence their overall success as a species. Some flowers might just become a little bit brighter colored than their predecessors and all of a sudden there's 10 times more of them around because we decided to plant more for Valentine's Day. So that species essentially evolved by developing a new trait and gained more success as a population by giving us something we want. So we've established that the mutations are random, but evolution itself is very far from being random. Mutations create a change, but it's the environment that will determine if that change is positive or negative. A mutation might cause a species to have a thinner co coat of fur, for example. Now, in a cold environment, this can be very bad and that offspring could potentially freeze to death very early in its life. However, if that same change happened in a hot environment, then it might be very beneficial if the coat of fur still blocks all harmful sun rays, but allows the animal to stay cooler, leading to a better ability to hunt, for example. Um, since the environment is the determining factor in what makes something more fit to survive, simply moving animals to a new environment will produce a new set of traits that's more suited to the new environment. Assuming, of course, that the species survives the move for long enough to reproduce many generations. So now, as promised, let's talk a bit about the evidence for evolution. When Charles Darwin first conceived the idea of evolution through natural selection, he was actually calling it descent with modification, referring to the DNA mutations that occur in offspring. He noted that population growth would lead to a struggle for existence, in which favorable traits would prevail while the unfavorable perished. We could dive a lot deeper into Charles Darwin here, but I'll just move past it uh, for now so we can talk about the evidence for evolution instead. So when it comes to supporting evolution, the number one piece of evidence is always fossils. Fossils help us understand how things evolved through time by dating them, putting them on the timeline, 
and actually physically seeing the changes in species over time. This evidence gives us enough of a framework to understand the mechanics of evolution and make accurate predictions that we can test for. This helps make an even more complete timeline by filling in gaps uh, between the fossils that we find. After all, fossils from hard body parts like shells, bones and teeth are very uncommon in the grand scheme of things, and we wouldn't be able to count on that before life even evolved the hard body parts. So ancient microfossils, which are fossils that require a telescope to see, and other impressions of various soft organisms in sediment are also very important for the full picture. So now that we have a timeline filled in with tangible evidence that we found, we can follow it backwards in time. If we do this for any species on Earth, we end up at what we call the last universal common ancestor. This is the common ancestor from which all living organisms on Earth descend from. Don't confuse this with the origin of life though. This is simply one of many organisms that existed at the time and survived, while all the others and their descendants eventually became extinct. The discovery of the last universal common ancestor is also one of the main pillars of evidence for evolution. It demonstrates that evolution does occur, and it illustrates all the processes that created all of Earth's biodiversity. Another way we can tell that evolution is real is by looking at the characteristics that serve no purpose at all in different organisms. Those are called vestigial traits. We as humans have quite a few vestigial remnants, including our appendix, goosebumps, wisdom teeth, tail bones, pheromone receptors in our nose, and more. Other animals have vestigial traits as well, like whales having hip bones, snakes with leg bones, and so on. We actually know evolution so well at this point uh, that we can very easily create computer software that mimics biology to evolve virtual creatures that can solve problems. We're actually so good at it that we can even virtually evolve things that wouldn't evolve in nature, like populations of windmills that gradually evolve their shape until the population is dominated by a design that's far superior to the ones we use today for translating wind into energy. This is because uh, in nature, fitness is about survival and reproduction, while in a computer, fitness is quite literally whatever we want it to be. Another way that we can use our knowledge, as with all other scientific theories, is by using it to make predictions. For example, if you see a flower with a very long neck and the pollen is at the bottom, then something with a very long tongue must exist to pollinate this flower, as was the case with one of Darwin's predictions. In science, we generally consider facts to be things that have been tested so many times that we no longer feel compelled to keep testing them. So a lot of theories are actually facts, and in that respect evolution is most definitely a fact. One thing that we often see though is evolution being pinned against religions or creators, but evolution doesn't actually attempt to explain the origin of life. That's a completely separate field of study. So it doesn't really make sense to pin them against each other in that way. Evolution makes no attempt to disprove creators of any kind. All it does is explain the mechanisms that governs the changes we see over time in a population. There is no conflict at the moment if you decide to hypothesize about the origin of life, you can still accept the evolution of species. I hope you enjoyed this video and a big thanks to my patrons for supporting the channel. If you want more, you can check out my website at respectyourintellect.com for many more videos. Until next time, thanks for watching and remember, respect your intellect.